for the Gentiles in the house. This is good news. This is the gospel. That by faith, your heart has been purified. We are busy with a series in the book of Acts for those who are new with us today. And it's been quite a journey. Those who have been on the journey, can you attest to that? God has been really speaking to us, ministering to us. There's some powerful things that's been happening. Um, I'd love to do a recap, but we've gone so far into the book now. The recap might take a bit long. So I'm just going to quickly say the last few weeks, we had a message called Granted Repentance where Peter shares his testimony of how God changed his mind about the, uh, the gospel being for Jews and Gentiles. And we see the importance of how God is not someone who has favorites. He's not, he doesn't show partiality. Any person from any nation who fears him, he has granted them repentance. And we saw from fervent and persistent prayer that Peter was set free by an angel in prison. That was a powerful message. Uh, We had the message called Glad Tidings, which was about Paul um, bringing the gospel to the Gentiles again. We're starting to see this theme coming through strong, and it's going to be one for us today as well. Then we had a visit from our friend Michael Swain. He had a powerful message about biblical citizenship. If you missed that, please go and watch that. And last week, I spoke about preach, strengthen, encourage, Repeat. Well done. You guys got it. So how many of you were inspired by last week's message? Come on. For me, it was really powerful how God just breaks His Word open to us. And, and right from that, we are now going to see something really significant happen in the book of Acts. And today's message is called Through the Grace. Through the Grace. And this is from the text today. And it's a powerful, powerful moment Because what we're going to see is the early church where the Jewish followers who have now become followers of Christ are struggling with this idea that the same gospel message that has come for them is now available to the Gentiles. It's still this thing of like people wrapping their heads around this. And one of the things that people tend to do when they don't understand something, if their culture has been one way and they have stepped into something new and now they see there's another culture that has can also have this they want to apply their cultural rules to these new people and this is exactly what the message is about today so we're going to talk about the grace of God how many of you think you've got a perfect grasp of what God's grace is because then you can come and preach that'll be great not that I have a perfect grasp it's a journey But we're going to dive into that today. I think the word grace, similar to the word love, can be easily misunderstood or given wrong meanings or just be abused in the Christian faith. And I want to make sure that after today, we all have a solid word-based understanding of what this means. And I believe that for all of us, it's going to be something that really sets us free in a powerful way. Amen. So the word grace... I'm going to quickly go into the etymology of the word, which is a fancy word for saying where the word came from. It comes from the word, the Latin word gratis or gratia, which also means grateful and which also is the root word for grateful and gratitude. So can you see there's an amazing uh, link between the word grace and grateful, having gratitude, all right? And grace, we're going to look at three powerful meanings that we get from Scripture Um, in terms of what grace means. So the one that many of us may know, but I think not fully understand, is the one that we mostly hear about in the Word of God. And that is that the grace of God is Him endowing, giving, unmerited favor. He's, He's the gift that is unmerited. In other words, you cannot earn it, you cannot work for it, you cannot do something to get it. It is unmerited favor. The other word you can use is undeserved favor. It cannot be earned. It is freely given. So that's the one aspect of grace we're going to look at. Then the second one is grace is also the empowerment to live a holy life. 
You see, in the world, many people, especially in cultural Christianity, we are, some people tend to abuse the word grace by using it as an excuse to live the way they want to live and saying, what God has forgiven me, I'm okay. But then they just continue in sin. That is not what Jesus died on a cross for. That's not what his grace is for. His grace is the empowerment to live a holy life. Amen. And then thirdly, we hear from the word of God in the, in the Hebrew text, we're gonna, I'm going to read it later to you, that we are invited, there's an invitation for believers to approach the throne of grace with confidence. Amen. And these are the beautiful things we hear about what it is. For those who may not know, there's a difference. In the English language, it's nice. We have the word grace and we have the word mercy. In Afrikaans, genade is used for both, as far as I know. So it's a little bit confusing. But grace is undeserved favor. Mercy is the act of withholding deserved punishment. So mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve. Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. Are you with me? All right. So, what would the opposite of grace, the first category of grace then be? The opposite of grace would be then merited or deserved favor. In other words, uh, receiving something because you worked for it. You have done certain things and now you think you deserve a reward, right? I've worked, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, so now I must. And if we take it into spiritual consideration, Lord, I've done this, Lord, I've done this, Lord, I've done this, now, Lord, you have to. And if we, th- we think if we work consistently for it by our own strength, eventually we will have the reward. And in many religions around the world, and this is actually what separates Christianity from pretty much every other religion in the world. In every other religion in the world, you have to work, 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 work to earn a certain place. And then you still are not sure that when you close your eyes in this side of eternity, what happens on the other side? You still don't really know. But with us, we can know. Amen, which is really awesome. So it, if, if there is something I have to do to get grace, if, if, if it is merited, it means that there's actually an obstacle or a hindrance between me and grace. Can you see that? Because there's something that I have to do. There's something that I have to overcome. There's something in the way. There's a hindrance. Do you understand that? So I want you to have that picture. What grace is, the opposite of grace is that, but grace is the unmerited favor of God. Just for interest's sake, I want to just throw out these facts. There are 131 uses of grace in the Bible, if you look at the ESV translation. 124 are in the New Testament. In other words, there's only seven references to grace in the Old Testament. 124 is in the New Testament. And 86 of them are where the Apostle Paul used them. So 86 out of 124 times, Paul is talking about grace. That's also one of the reasons some people refer to him as the apostle of grace. All right, so there's just some interesting facts. So let's get into the word of God and, and read about what happens here today. So I want you to get excited, get ready to hear from the word of the Lord. Amen? Come on. Yes. All right, so Acts 15, verse 1. And, in, and certain men came from Judea and taught, I want you to notice that word, taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. This is how this chapter starts. Boom, drop the mic. They are unsettling the whole process. Up until now, we've just been hearing how amazing it is. The gospel spreads to the Gentiles. There's resistance from the Jews, but we're seeing all these awesome things. Now, in the camp of the ones we are rooting for, we see this change. We see that now some of the Jewish believers have come with a mission. They have a conviction, and they really believe that they are right. How many of you have met religious people? You may have been one yourself. 
When you were stuck in a religious mindset, your intentions were great. I am doing the right thing. I need to help people. That's what you convince yourself of, right? And I need to tell them. Otherwise, they won't know. Have you met people like that? They make you, this is the sign of a religious mindset, all right? And, and this is the fruit of what they are doing. They are saying there's something that you have to do in order to. In other words, they put an obstacle, a hindrance in the way of you receiving salvation. So they specifically say, if you don't do this, you cannot be saved. What are they already? They are already saved. They are speaking to Gentiles who have heard the gospel, received the gospel, probably already have been baptized and baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now they come afterwards and say to them, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, how many of you know that they didn't have the New Testament yet? It was literally being written while this is happening. So all these Gentile believers have is what they've been told by Paul, Barnabas, and the others, Peter, whoever was leading them to Christ. They did not, and then they were starting to hear about the Old Testament. But the, the perspective that they had from a Paul and a Peter was that, hey, look at how the Old Testament prophesied about Jesus' coming, how it's been fulfilled, and listen, amazing news for you Gentiles, you can just walk into the grace that Jesus has given you. No need for going through all the law and the, the, the traditions of the Jewish belief. Now there's Jews, Jews who come and say to the Gentiles, no, 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 <clears throat> unless... Unless you are circum, what is that? That is a condition. There's a condition, there's a hindrance. Now, verse two. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, (laughs) they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles as they call, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. Now, what do we see here? We see one mindset, a religious mindset. Now, the interesting thing is they have come to the belief that Jesus is the Messiah. They have. But they're still holding on to what they've been taught from birth, that Moses, the law, you have to. On the eighth day, you've got to be circumcised. If you didn't, if, you, if you're a proselyte who comes into the Jewish belief, you have to go all the way. Now, apart from it being a very scary prospect physically, it's also, it's also something that kind of jars you when you hear that, now, no, 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 you've received, received something, but you still have to do something. And I don't know what kind of traditional church you grew up in, or if you did, but typically if you grew up in some kind of traditional church, there were do's and don'ts. And if you, then you. Only if you, then you will. And then you get some people, I think some of them are well-intentioned, but I think some of them are not, who just decide that they should be the moral police. And they, they add these things they, they take scripture even and manipulate it and they start putting stuff on you and they, there's, there's even been cults and sects and different kinds of religions within the Christian religion that have popped up and, and they've taken stuff that has completely been dealt with by Christ on the cross and they've brought it back to life and they've put it on people. And some of you have been through that. Some of you, maybe even till recently, as soon as someone says, you have to, Unless you, be careful. If it doesn't line up with the original gospel message that got you saved, be very, very careful. Because just because someone speaks with a lot of authority and, and seeming that they know what they're talking about doesn't mean they are right. It has to be tested against the true gospel message by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And what we see here is Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them. This is a very typical way that the writer of Acts, uh, Luke, Luke wrote this. Who remembers when Peter was released by the angel from prison? It says the next day, there was no small stir among the soldiers who was looking after him. So Luke has this interesting way of, you know, pointing out something hectic by sort of underplaying it. He does the euphemism. 
But there was, what you must read is there was a massive fight about this. They had an argument. What? Christians arguing? Yes. Sometimes they don't agree. But look at what they do. They don't just argue and, and turn their backs on one another. They say, listen, we need to take this up. We need to take it up to the leadership in Jerusalem. And so they go. And, but I love this about Peter and Barnabas on the way to discussing whether Gentiles need to adhere to the law of Moses. They tell everyone about what they've already seen, how the Gentiles have come to Christ. They're like, hey, listen to the, how the Gentiles got converted and received Christ. It's pretty powerful, right? Ne? See it? Yeah. Okay. Verse 6. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, look at that, Christians at a leadership level having a dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. What is Peter doing? He is reminding them of something that's already happened that he has already testified about. But we see when the religious mindset comes in, it wants to prove, it wants to, it wants to from flesh do something. And it just feels right. I, I need to, it just can't be this easy. <laughs> I've worked my whole life, you know, to tick all these boxes. How, how is it possible that someone can just come along and receive this? No, 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 no. There must be some rules. Now, this thing starts to surface. And to some, it sounds even good and positive. And now Peter needs to remind them of what already happened. So he basically gives a new account of his already testimony that he did. He says from verse 8, So God, who knows the heart acknowledge them, the Gentiles, by giving them the Holy Spirit. Remember in that chapter, Peter preached the word of God to Cornelius the centurion and his whole household. And while he was sharing the gospel, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. This is what he's recounting, just as he did to us. Now what's he saying? He said, guys, the same way that God gave his Holy Spirit to us, The Jews, he gave it to them, the Gentiles. What's he doing? He's saying, my Jewish friend, just get off your pedestal, please. God shows no partiality. Can you see that? And then he says in verse nine, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying, very important word while he's talking to Jewish people, purifying their hearts by faith. Yo, that's powerful. And you sitting in front of me, I think all of you are Gentiles. Any, anyone here from Jewish descent? None, okay. We have to work on that, by the way. But for, for the Gentiles in the house, this is good news. This is the gospel, that by faith, your heart has been purified. Amen? And Peter, a Jew, he gets this. Because God showed him a vision three times and then he prophetically showed him he needs to go to this house of Gentiles, which a Jew is not allowed to do. A Jew believes that Gentiles are unclean. What is Peter saying? He, they've been purified. They've been made clean. They've been ritually made clean by faith. So for a Jewish ear, this is challenging. But he's telling the truth. So now it's working in their hearts. Look at what happens next. Now therefore, he continues to say, now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? And here comes our title. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. What is Peter doing? He's like, guys, in Jesus Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. We are all one. We read that later in the New Testament many times from Paul. We are one. Amen? And this was a very hard thing for them to understand. How many of you grew up in here and you were almost taught 
to not like OGS people. Like, what is that about? If, if you are reformed or reformed, you're like, you think NG people are charismatic. Well, that's how I grew up. And I don't know if, how, how it is for Methodists and Anglicans. I mean, we have all these denominations and all the denominations go like, we are right. In other words, the other one is wrong. And they would give you reasons why. Some churches broke off and became their own thing for silly reasons like we wear ties or we only sing psalms, not hymns. That was reasons for churches to split and then the whole church movement starts from an offense and from a disagreement and from a you have to or unless you. A whole church starts from that. What is it built upon? It's built upon disunity, distrust, and religion. Not on relationship with God and definitely not on grace. Can you see that? I've just offended like five denominations. <laughs> this is going to go down well. But how many of you know that Jesus says, go into all the world and make denominations of all people? Does, did he say that? What did he say? Make disciples, all right? <laughs> I want to read verse 10 and 11 again. Now, therefore, why do you test God? Guys, there's only one time in the Bible where God says, you can test me. But when Jesus was tempted in the, in the desert by the enemy, and the enemy used Scripture to convince him to jump off the temple. And Jesus said, the, the word also says, it is also written, you shall not test the Lord your God. So we are not allowed to test God according to the scriptures. But there's one time in Malachi 3, where God said, test me in this. And it's about the tithe, if you didn't know that. Tithe and test me if I will not open up the heavens over you. That's the only time we can test God. Every other time it's disobedience. Why would you test God? about what he's already done and put a yoke on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. He's being real. He's being vulnerable. He's like, guys, you know as well as I do all these rules and regulations and man-made things that we've been told to do, we can't do them. Paul, later in one of his letters, he explains the law is a schoolmaster. It's, the schoolmaster is there to teach you that you cannot do this. You need Jesus. The law was there to tell you, you cannot do this. That was just the Ten Commandments and the 603 other laws. You cannot live up to this. What, over the years, what the rabbis did is they added more and more and more rules. The last book of the Bible, Malachi, between Malachi and when we, when we read about John the Baptist coming, there's about 400 years of, of the Lord being quiet. So for 400 years, just through oral uh, uh, and written, um, what's oorlevering? Delivering the message over the centuries, more and more rules were made by the rabbis to the people putting a yoke on them, making it even more impossible. And when Jesus was walking on earth and he was challenging the Pharisees, he was telling to them, you have put impossible yokes on these people that you don't even live up to. And this is what Peter is being real about. He's saying, you want to put a yoke on Gentiles that God never told they should have, that you can't even bear. Can you see that? But we believe that through the grace, everyone say, through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. That's powerful. I love it. Sure. Verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silent. You know what shuts up a religious spirit? The truth. And listened. And to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. So first we had Peter, who recalls his testimony. Now Paul and Barnabas talk about their journey and how they saw God work among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, in other words, this time it's when Paul and Barnabas were quiet, they stopped speaking. 
James now comes to the forefront and answered saying, men and brethren, listen to me. Simon Peter, who spoke earlier, has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. What is he saying? Guys, I've got news for you. Abraham was a Gentile. What? So Abraham was a Gentile. He took them from the land of the Chaldeans and he separated Abraham unto himself. And from him, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob became Israel. Israel became the people of God. (laughs) I'm so glad I can teach you something. But look at the revelation. I just want to point out, this has been written in the Bible for hundreds of years. You've probably read it a few times. And you didn't realize that James just dropped a bomb in the middle of the Jews. Abraham is not a Jew? What? Think about it. God created a nation from nothing. That was his plan from the start. Here's a question that might blow your mind, just sidetracking for a moment. How many Israelites started out living in Egypt? Think of the story. So, Abram, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob has how many sons? Twelve. Who went to Egypt against his will? <laughs> Became second in charge. He had a dream about his brothers bowing before him, right? Do you remember that? Now the brothers come because there's famine. Because he also laid out the dream of the Pharaoh about seven, uh, seven, mariara, yeah, seven fat years and then seven skinny years. <laughs> Lean years. Thank you, my son. The years were like my jeans, skinny. Now, out of that, God gave him favor, and he was second in charge of, Israel, of, of Egypt, which was the reigning power at the time. Then his family came from far, from the promised land. Did you know they were in the promised land at that stage? But they were few. They were just the family. They came, and they started, and he gave them the best land, Goshen, in Egypt. They were not a multitude they grew into a multitude over the next 400 years. Then they became the millions. But they started out small. This was God's people. He had a plan for them. And while they were in, for the first while, it was going well. Because the Pharaoh remembered Joseph. But then there came a Pharaoh that didn't remember Joseph. And then he started saying, whoa, these Jews are populating like rabbits. And they became scared of their growth. And so they came against them and and they said, we need to to put them under submission and make them slaves. And then they started crying out to their God. And by the time Moses came around, it had been 400 years. And Moses was only called back when he was 80 (laughs) to say, let my people go. Now, what is James doing? He's like, brothers, sisters, Abram was a Gentile. Can you imagine how this must freak them out? If they haven't made the math, did the math. Uh, Verse 15, and with this, the words of the prophets agree just as it's written. Now he's quoting scripture to support what he's saying. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind, the rest of mankind, the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles, everybody say all the Gentiles, who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things, known to God from eternity and all his works. In one sentence, James has quoted Isaiah 45, 21, Jeremiah 12, 15, Amos 9, 11, and 12. Boom. Verse 19, therefore, because this is true, 
I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. We should not trouble those. Trouble means putting a hindrance in front of them, which is not grace. But that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. What is he saying? He's saying that, guys, let's not put that in front of them. But let's write to them and say, these things are good anyway, plus it will please the Jews who read these things and know these things already. And it's just good for them to not do sexual immorality and eat strangled things and drink fresh blood. That's pretty good not to do anyway. <laughs> so then they agree. Verse 22, Then it pleased the apostles and elders, elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabbas and Silas. Here we see Silas for the first time, leading men, men um, uh, among the brethren. They wrote this letter to them. Listen to the letter. The apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Sicilia. Greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled, there's that word again, have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. So we're just clearing it up. We didn't send them to tell you this. It seemed good to us being assembled with one accord. Look at that. They were dissenting. They were fighting, but then they came together in one accord to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit... He's bringing the Holy Spirit who's, who was their counsel and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So when, verse 30, so when they were sent off, they came to Antioch and when they had gathered the multitude of believers... Now Jews and Gentiles alike, they delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Do you see that word? Who remembers last week's message? Preach, strengthen, repeat. Now Judas and Silas themselves being prophets also exhorted, which means encouraged, and what's another word from last week? Strengthened. Can we hear the word strengthened? The brethren with many words. Can we hear that some words trouble and some words encourage and strengthen? The truth will encourage and strengthen. A religious mindset and lies will trouble. Can we see that? After they had, been, they had stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren and the, uh, to the apostles. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch. Why? Because they were teaching and preaching the word of the Lord. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Preach, strengthen, encourage, repeat. We're going to see this pattern a lot. And I want you to remember that. There's a few more verses in this chapter that basically just says there was a bit of a fight between Paul and Barnabas about whether um, Mark can join them, John Mark can join them, and then they split up, and Barnabas went with John Mark, and Paul went with Silas, and that's where their journey starts. I'm not going to read that now because it's just kind of a factual account of what happens. What I really want to focus on today for the rest of our time together is grace and the power of grace and what it means. So I want to read to us scriptures about the fact that grace is not legalism, but Christ. Let us read together from Colossians 2, verse 11. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Powerful. What did we just hear happened in the book of Acts? They... Some believers from the Jewish background came and said, unless 
you get circumcised and follow Moses, you cannot be saved. What is Paul now saying to the church in Colossus? He's saying, in him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. And the gentlemen, Gentile men go, yes. By putting off what? The body, the flesh, the carnality of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. You see, even Gentiles, when they receive Christ, are marked. But we are marked in our spirits. Amen? And we are buried with Him in baptism. This is also a beautiful picture of baptism. We get the um, symbolism connected between what baptism is all about and what circumcision used to be for. And the fact that in Christ it's not necessary for that because we receive a spiritual circumcision and baptism is a symbolic gesture of that. Dying to the flesh and raising with Christ. Are you with me? All right. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Woo! Having disarmed, this is spiritual language, disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So, guys, because this is true of what Jesus had done, so let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come but the substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding fast to the head from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that's from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ, how many of you have died with Christ? Oh, we're going to have a big altar call today. <laughs> Not a lot of hands went up. If you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. Men making up rules that we should live by. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom and self, in self-imposed religion. Whew, self-imposed religion. False humility and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. I want to encourage you to read Colossians 2 over and over and over and over again and meditate on this piece of Scripture because it will change your life. It is one of the best explanations of what grace is not. Making us understand that there's nothing that you can do to earn a place in the kingdom of God and nothing that you have to keep on doing that are works of the flesh. So do not let people cheat you. Do not let people convince you of stuff that you have to do. Because as soon as there's a have to or a unless or a, uh, by this condition and this condition, be careful. If it's not written in the Word of God as a spiritual instruction, there's a lot of have to's there. And I've told this church many times, a lot of times the Bible teaches us if, then. If you do this, then this will follow. So it's probably good to do this. But I'm not talking about those principles that we as Christians do need to follow. And we need to follow what Christ has commanded us to do. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. I'm not talking about those that are written down from Jesus. We're talking about all the other stuff that people want to put on, on you. Or when they go back to the law and say, hey, 613 laws, laka laka. This is, for, this is still for the church today. That's a lie. It's a complete fabrication of the truth. It's not true. There was a time 
when a f- three of my best friends were wrapped up in what is called the Hebrew Roots Movement. And it was a really difficult time. Really difficult time. And I was struggling to understand it because if three of my best friends who love Jesus got into this, what am I missing? Am I maybe wrong? And I would study the scriptures. I would spend time with God. I would ask them questions. They would tell me stuff. And a lot of the things they tell you initially sounds great. They're like, did you know the Hebrew root, Hebrew word for this means this? And it's actually quite amazing. You go, wow, that's awesome. And then the rabbit hole opens up. And then they jump to a conclusion where you go, hmm, wait a minute. I don't know how you got from there to there, but now that puts a thing on me. It puts an obstacle in my way. And it doesn't sound like grace. It sounds like I have to do something to earn grace, which is not the gospel. And I kept hearing this, hearing this, hearing this. And then one day I was praying. I was like, Lord, what is this about? And I just felt the Holy Spirit gently tell me, they're deceived. They've been deceived. And then in that same moment, I got Colossians 2. And I read it and it was like, everything started opening up to me. Do not let anyone cheat you by saying, you have to do this, you have to do this. But it says specifically by new moons, by festivals, by Sabbaths. Jesus is our Sabbath. He is our rest. He fulfilled the law and the prophets completely. That's what he's come to do. So be careful when you yourself start saying, you have to. You have to what? According to who? Do not put burdens on people. Do you you hear my heart? It's gone very quiet. Do you believe the word of God is the word of God? All right, do I need to read this again? (laughs) He says specifically, do not let anyone judge you in food or drink. I mean, these people stopped eating pork and made a big deal about it. Regarding a festival, they kept all the festivals of the Jews. As a rule, a new moon or Sabbath. Now, are these festivals still important? Absolutely. Do we have to keep them? No. Should we be aware of them and, and look out for the signs around them? Yeah, sure. But it's not a religious activity that binds you. That's the difference. Do you understand that? I, you guys know I love Israel and I love the Jewish people. But I'm a Gentile. I'm not a Jew. I'm not going to be trying to be a Jew. Thank God I don't have to be circumcised as an adult. There are some who've done that because they go down this rabbit hole and they believe it and they get circumcised. Don't let anyone cheat you of your reward. We've received a reward by grace. I feel like I need to say this again, but I hope you've got it because we still have a few verses to get through. I want to read to you about, from the Bible, more confirmation about undeserved and unmerited favor. We're going to hear from Paul in the book of Romans. Those of you who remember, we did the book of Romans last year, a whole series on it. But I want to highlight a few passages for you. Romans 3 from verse 21. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Did you hear that? The righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. You see the power of belief and faith. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness. Because He, in His forbearance, God had passed over. Do you see that? God had passed over. The Passover lamb. He passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. If you have been justified, you have been counted the justifier. Such a beautiful phrase. Can you see that Paul is trying, who remembers that he was speaking to a audience of Jews and Gentiles? The church was a mixture Can you see that even from the time of Acts, there was still this struggle. He had to speak to the Jews about not putting the law on the Gentiles. And he had to speak to the Gentiles about not taking grace um, as a, a rule to do whatever they want. So he needed to get the guys from law and the guys from license onto liberty in Christ Jesus. Romans 5.15, but the free gift, everyone say free gift. 
Free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense, he's talking about Adam, many died, much more the grace of God, the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Everyone was cursed because of Adam. The offense was the disobedience of Adam and Eve in the garden. That was the offense that cursed all of mankind. That's why all fall short of the glory of God. That's the horrible bad news. Remember we spoke about what's the bad news and why do we have the good news? He's putting it into perspective. He said, if that was true, how much more through the grace of Jesus Christ does freedom abound to all? Am am I the only one getting this? Are you excited about the grace of God? Come on. All right. Romans 11, 5 to 6. Even so then, at this present time, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. He's talking about the Jewish remnant. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. If there's any works of my flesh involved, it's no longer grace, but it is works. But if, it is, but if it is of works, it is, of, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. It sounds like a riddle. But he's trying to tell you that even if you mix a little bit of human effort and work in with grace, it's no longer grace. And if you try to mix a little bit of grace into work, it's no longer work. Can you see that? The two can't mix It's either the one or the other. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Bring the revelation. Then, other verses, this talks about the unmerited favor. Through Christ Jesus, we are saved by grace through faith. Got that. When you came to Christ, you surrendered and you received. That's all you had to do. You had to do something. Sometimes people say, you don't have to do anything. Uh, You have to actually receive. You can't save yourself, but you actually have to step forward, believe and receive. So there's something that you have to do. But that unlocks the grace. If you remember the, the whole journey we had through the book of Romans, one standard, one gift, you can only receive the gift of you, open it up. Anyway, you can go back and listen to that. Now we're going to talk about how grace empowers us to live holy lives. 1 Corinthians 15 from verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles. This is Paul referring to himself. I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But, he's like, this is who I used to be. But, by what? By the fact that I worked really hard. By the fact that I performed and impressed God. By the fact that I fasted for seven months. No, by the grace of God. I am what I am. Can you say that today, saint? By the grace of God, I am what I am. Just wake up each day and start your prayer with that. By the grace of God, I am what I am. I am no longer what I used to be by the grace of God. And His grace toward me was not in vain. He did not waste His grace on me, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Now this seems confusing. You just said it's not by works, it's by grace, but then you said you labored. What is going on? The work that follows Receiving the gift of grace and stepping into the journey of a Christian to do what God has called you to do, there are certain actions that need to follow. If you read the book of James and you read Paul as a young Christian, you can get confused because Paul is like, by grace, by grace, by grace. And then James says, well, show me your faith by your works. It's like, what is it now? See, once again, we have to understand as Christians, justification, sanctification, glorification. Many of the scriptures that we get that gets us confused is about justification being confused with sanctification. The first things I read here about Romans, that's about justification. 
the free gift of grace from Jesus. He died on a cross. He rose from the grave. If I believe in his name, which means salvation, I am saved. By grace, through faith, I'm saved. Now I'm saved. Now, am I going to just stand here for the rest of my life and wait for heaven to come? No, I'm actually going to live. I'm going to do a work. I'm going to do things. But what is that work that I'm doing empowered by? Me or the Holy Spirit? Am I living a holy life through my own effort or am I living a holy life by the power of the Holy Spirit? And this is what he's talking about. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. It is the grace of God that empowers him to do what God has called him to do. What, uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able. Everyone say, God is able. He's able. He's able. I uh, No one knows the song, babe. We have to educate them. I know my Lord is able to carry me through. Okay. God is able to make all grace abound to you. That. Okay, so grace has a purpose. Always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for what? Every good work. Can you see the connection? Okay, I'm going to read it again. And God is able to make all grace abound to you that He's abounding grace to you for a purpose. Always having all sufficiency. What does that mean? Having all that I need in all things. Everybody say all things. Not some things. All things may have abundance. That's a lot. That's more than enough. For what? Every good work. The context here that Paul is talking about was he was raising up a collection for the church in Jerusalem. And he was talking to them about being cheerful givers. And he's saying that it is only by understanding grace and being empowered by grace that you can be cheerful givers, which is a good work in line with the kingdom of God. Are we we following? Let's make it practical. We have teams that serve in this church. They are doing good work because in every department that they help, that department is necessary for this church to operate, to reach people with the gospel. So when someone rocks up and says, I'm here to serve, if they are serving from the power that the grace of God gives them, then they can never run out of steam. But if they come either with an intention to be seen or to impress someone or if they're trying to do it out of their own effort because they're trying to impress God, they will run out of steam. And their expectation will be, hey, see me, hey, acknowledge me, hey, tell me all the time that I'm amazing, otherwise I'm going to be offended and I'm going to leave. But if the intention is that I'm here because God has called me to be here and I'm empowered by the grace and I, I can never run out of steam, I may be physically tired after a Sunday, but I cannot wait to do this again because I know I'm called to do this. Do you hear the difference? All right. 2 Corinthians 12. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. How many of you feel weak sometimes? His strength makes us perfect in our weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities than the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. Do you see that the grace of God is empowerment to live a holy life, to to stay on course and to do what God has called us to do. Baby, here come I join. I want to read this last piece of scripture and then we're going to respond to the word of God. In Hebrews 4 from verse 14, it says, Seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. 
For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore, because this is true, because we have a Savior that understands temptation and weakness, because this is true, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need.